In screening for prostate cancer, if the PSA comes back high, oftentimes the next step is to get a random needle biopsy. So there's a group in Sweden who took thousands of men with elevated PSAs and they broke them down into two different groups. One they gave targeted biopsies to, and the other they gave random needle biopsies. And the results were very interesting. So Dr. Scholz, who's a medical oncologist for over 30 years, is gonna break down the study. And really the point of the study is, do we need to find Gleason 6 prostate cancer? And if we don't need to find it, what are the next steps to find clinically significant prostate cancer, which would be anything over Gleason 6? I hope you find this educational. So in the last couple of videos, we've been talking about significant studies that have been published in really prestigious journals. One of the journals that we've talked about is the New England Journal of Medicine. And in December of 2022, they came out with this landmark study, which is really interesting. So it's talking about screening for, you know, Gleason 6 prostate cancer and using PSA for, and using targeted biopsies versus random needle biopsies. Now to break this down, can you explain what Gleason 6 is? And then we can kind of talk about the differences between the targeted and the random needle biopsies as well. Yes, absolutely. So it's interesting that in Sweden, they spent millions of dollars looking at strategy to try and diagnose less Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Uh, we now know Gleason 6 is a harmless variant of prostate cancer that never metastasizes, arguably maybe shouldn't even be called cancer. If this is picked up in the course of screening for prostate cancer, why should we care? When that word cancer, like an arrow, penetrates the mind of a patient, it's very hard to eradicate the fear. Behind those fears, we have a, a very smooth and efficient industry that is poised to treat it. And unfortunately, we don't have an, a, a non-toxic treatment for early stage prostate cancer. So if men with good intentions go into treatment for Gleason 6 getting radiation or surgery, they are uh, at very significant risk of serious sexual urinary problems that can be lifelong. And that's why they did this study. They wanted to see if a strategy could be developed so that in the process of screening men with high PSAs, in this case it was PSA over three, that they could diagnose fewer men with three plus three. They want to find the higher grades, the sevens, eights, nines, and tens, but ideally not find the three plus threes. Before I get to my next question, please click the subscribe button. When you do this, it's telling YouTube that this video was helpful for you, and it'll push these types of videos out to other people who are searching for answers. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. 87 cents of every single dollar goes back to creating content just like this. Now back to this video on random needle biopsies versus targeted biopsies. So the difference is between a random needle biopsy versus an MRI targeted biopsy. So when I think about a random needle biopsy, I've heard you talk about kind of the clock pattern, you know, it's 12 to 14 needles in a prostate and they're going around, or even a grid pattern. My thought when I, you know, was first learning about it is wouldn't you miss the cancer in between? Why are we not using imaging in today's day and age? And, you know, it's interesting, even though we have MRIs, we're still seeing a rampant usage of random needle biopsies across the US and all over the world now that we have this international audience. So can you explain kind of the modalities of how MRI targeted biopsies are done? Um, there's you know different types and also what are the benefits of it versus a random needle biopsy? Getting an MRI when your PSA is above some threshold in this study, I, the uh, PSA greater than three, as a first step, rather than uh, simply jumping into the random needle biopsy that you mentioned, uh, is a new policy that is starting to pick up momentum around the world uh, because it's a better approach, but it has not become universally accepted. So there's still a million men every year in the United States that are just getting a random biopsy because that's the way it's always been done. Like you say, the logic behind doing an imaging study and targeting an abnormality in the gland uh, makes a whole lot more sense because they can use fewer needle sticks just to go after the little shadow rather than just sticking needles everywhere. And it's been clearly shown that you're more likely to find the type of cancer that needs treatment when you target a spot rather than just randomly stick needles around. The question that comes up, of course, is if it is better to do an MRI-directed biopsy, is it even better to do both? And uh, 
we'll go into that issue more as this article addresses that question. But I think you're right in highlighting that the first steps that men take after they discover their PSA is above the normal range uh, can really change the course of their future if they just jump into a random biopsy as opposed to doing an MRI first. And in uh, many men that do the MRI first who don't have any spots or suspicious areas won't need any biopsy according to the results of this recent study. So one of the things I would like to clarify, I was at a conference and we were talking to some prostate cancer patients and they heard this big study that Dr. Klotz was talking about where Gleason 6 does not metastasize. And they said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if, doesn't Gleason 6, like doesn't that cancer turn into a more aggressive cancer? And so we had to explain to them, no, Gleason 6 is completely separate. If you do have a high PSA and they do target another lesion and it's any other type of Gleason grade that is higher than 6, that's not the same tumor. And so one of the things that I realized is that patients need to understand that not finding that Gleason 6 doesn't mean that those particular tumors that are, that are Gleason 6 that are, are in the prostate are going to turn into something else. And can you, can you explain that better? You know, this is a patient, but can you give me the physician you know, perspective? I think you explained it very well. And the idea that you can have different types of cancer from one organ, I think is nicely illustrated in the skin cancer world where we have a more sem sensible way to name things. So we call the harmless skin cancers like basal cells and squamous cells. And we call the more consequential cancers melanomas. Totally different name, totally different disease but they both come from the skin. In the prostate world, sadly, we use a numbering system that gives an idea that there's sort of a continuum. Basal cells and squamous cells do not turn into melanomas. They never turn into melanomas. Low-grade prostate cancers don't turn into high-grade cancers. But because you can have more than one skin cancer in your lifetime, you can have more than one prostate cancer in your lifetime as well. Because if I'm thinking I'm getting a random needle biopsy or a targeted biopsy, either way, if that Gleason 6 is being missed, I want to make sure it doesn't turn into something. Because everybody's going, shouldn't you know ahead of time, we're always pushing screening. So if we're pushing screening, shouldn't we know everything? And that's kind of the conundrum when it comes to the world of prostate cancer. You just think, well, if I know everything, I'm going to have more power and I'm going to know my steps. And to a certain extent, that's true. But because the medical system is just ready to treat, you can also suffer significant side effects. So can you talk about the results of this, this study and what you think is the most important point to a patient who's reading it? So in the study, they did a really nice job of evaluating the relative benefit of doing a targeted biopsy and, and or a random biopsy. And what they found, the bottom line of what they found was that the addition of a random biopsy to an MRI targeted biopsy doubles the incidence of finding 3 plus 3, which is not unexpected, but they quantified it, and uh, that is the type of risk that you take when you do a random biopsy. You're twice as likely to find 3 plus 3. The other thing they found was that by skipping the random biopsy, there was a 5% chance that you could miss something that you might want to treat. The 5% the that were missed were small and low grade. They were 3 plus 4s in all cases. So the MRI targeted biopsies were missing very little significant cancer, but they did miss some very small intermediate risk grade cancers, and it was at about 5% of the patients. So this is the trade-off. What is worse, the dangers of, of uh, being unnecessarily told you have cancer and possibly leading to unnecessary surgery and radiation because people get scared, or delaying the diagnosis of a small intermediate risk cancer for perhaps a year because uh, to mitigate the risks of this, of course, we advise everyone who has an MRI that doesn't show anything, that they repeat the MRI a year later. And if there was a small um, intermediate grade cancer that was missed on the initial MRI, if it is growing, it should be picked up in a timely fashion while it's still curable. I think we have to mate the policy of foregoing biopsy altogether in men with normal MRIs, so PSA is up a little bit, MRI is normal, no biopsy, with the uh, injunction to get another MRI a year later in case you're in that 5% category where there's something too small to be detected uh, on the initial MRI. So being a medical oncologist, you know, you're not a urologist doing biopsies, random needle biopsies. You do do targeted biopsies with color Doppler in your practice, I know that. But, you know, in a, your perfect world as a medical oncologist, 
across the planet would you say we should not do like random needle biopsies at all? Or are there particular cases where you say, no, this is where this should be used, but MRI should be first? I don't see any scenarios now where we need a random needle biopsy any longer. Uh, we would query ourselves because some men have a lot of prostatitis, they run really high PSAs and their MRIs are clear and uh, you kind of get nervous. Is there something we could be missing? Um, that fear has been assuaged to a large degree now with these new PSMA PET scans. Rather than going in and just randomly harpooning the prostate, what we'll do is get a PET scan and make sure that there's no cancer. Uh, modern uh, PSMA PET scans are over 90% accurate for picking up cancer either in or outside the prostate gland. So I don't see a role for random biopsy anymore in 2023 now 2024. So a common question I get now because we're talking about PSMA PET scans is why don't we do PSMAs first? Why even do MRIs? Well, there's a little bit of radiation in a PSMA PET scan. The uh, beauty of MRIs, there's no radiation at all. MRIs are far less expensive now. Uh, they're doing studies where they don't do any contrast and they're getting the cost of these scans down to, you know, $500. So that makes it far more attractive. PET scan retailing now for five to $7,000. So um, no radiation, less expensive, a lot more experience. PSMA PET scans are new. We've been using prostate MRIs now for eight or nine years with, with uh, greater and greater frequency. But as a backup, it's nice to know that those PSMA PET scans are available to double check things. And as far as the MRI goes, you know, 10 years ago we were talking about 1.5 Tesla, you know, the magnet that's used in these MRIs versus 3T. Would you say that 3T MRIs are the most common? And if somebody does encounter a 1.5, do they need to go get the three? Yes, definitely. I think there can, three Tesla MRIs are considered the standard. And even more important than that, the doctors who are reading these MRIs uh, need to be very experienced. PSMA PET scans are fairly straightforward. PET scans have been around for a long time uh, in the interpretation. Prostate MRIs are uh, more challenging. So if you're going to a center that's only doing a few prostate MRIs a month, you probably should have those uh, images over read at a you know, university uh, somewhere to make sure that the interpretation is correct. So can you talk about the potential risks to a patient when it comes to side effects of treating Gleason 6? There may be you know, pressure from their doctor saying, well, you have cancer, we've diagnosed you with cancer. So why would you not treat this? And kind of talk about the ins and outs of what they could experience. In my experience, for example, if people go have a radical uh, surgery on the prostate, let's say they're 60 years old, a healthy patient's satisfaction, if you sit them down in a quiet room, private room with the door closed and start asking them questions about how happy they are, say two or three years after the operation. Um, only about a third of the men are pleased and two thirds are um, disappointed with, w w with the choice they made. It's, it's really quite sad. Urinary leakage, ejaculating urine, um, didn't get all the cancer, uh, erectile dysfunction, that's, uh, it's really, really disappointing. Uh, if they made a more um, sensible selection of treatment, not that they needed treatment, but let's say they have a, a seed implant at a center of excellence, this, the satisfaction rates are maybe two out of three. If you're gonna make the mistake of treating something that doesn't need to be treated, avoid surgery. But there's still a significant risk of uh, harm, whether you know, even with state-of-the-art radiation for developing a primary, primarily uh, erectile dysfunction, sadly. If you have an elevated PSA, the number one thing I would say is please take your time and do your research. Oftentimes, men who have an elevated PSA are pushed into random needle biopsies. And if your doctor is telling you that you need a random needle biopsy, ask him about a targeted biopsy. Call your insurance company and ask if there's anybody that they know that does it in your area, or you can even Google it and ask centers if they take your insurance. The point of all this is to basically eliminate any unnecessary treatments or procedures that you have to go through. The less unnecessary things you go through, the better. We want your quality of life to be the best that it can be. Oftentimes, men with Gleason 6 prostate cancer are treated for it when it was never going to metastasize in the first place. And it really can affect their quality of life because the consequences and side effects of these treatments. So quality of life matters overall. Even in a cancer diagnosis, we need to make sure that we're prioritizing that. The least amount of treatment possible to eliminate the cancer or deal with it is best. 
If you need help getting ready for your medical appointments or asking questions, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are can prostate cancer patients who have been trained by our medical oncology team. It's information, not advice, but they help empower you with information so that you feel confident going into your doctor's offices and advocating for yourself. If you have a physician who is not you know, giving you your options, it's important to do your own research. The most important thing you can do is find out what type of prostate cancer you have and what all of your options are so that you can make an educated decision. And this is something that we're really passionate about here at PCRI. If you need more information, you can visit our website PC at pcri.org. Please remember you're not alone, and I hope you have a great week.